Am I on? You guys hear me? Okay, like Nathan said, uh, my name is Dr. Cameron Jolly. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. So I grew up in a small town in eastern Utah. Um, and it was great. Uh, it's known, if you can see that, do you want to, Nathan, do you want to turn the lights down again? Um, it's known for, as dinosaur land. So in the early uh, 20th century, they found a large deposit of dinosaur bones. Most of the bones that you find in the Smithsonian and uh, in, the, in New York uh, come actually from this quarry uh, near my hometown. I grew up skiing and snowboarding. This is uh, all my in-laws. This is my, their favorite photo of me because I'm taller than everybody, but I look like a hobbit in that photo. I'm like standing in a hole, I guess. So, and everybody else is on skis too. So, I went to dental school at Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, this is a picture of the Nova campus. Sorry, right here. And the best thing about Nova, not only could I live right across the street, but this was the Miami Dolphins training facility. And every day at lunch, we would go up to the top of that parking lot and we would sit there and we would watch uh, the Miami Dolphins train. Until, you guys remember, something called Spygate, right? Then, they wouldn't let us go up there and sit anymore, and they stationed security guards all along that, all along that uh, parking facility there. The other fun thing about my time at Nova was every morning as I was dragging my instruments and all my armamentarium for labs and everything across the street, I would, I would have to dodge Ricky Williams in his black Lamborghini, so, because he wouldn't slow down. <sighs> I did my residency after dental school in uh, Seattle, Washington, at the University of Washington, and I love the University of Washington. It's, it's probably the the prettiest place in the world for three months out of the year. Uh, my wife grew up in Texas. She grew up in Allen. I have two kids, Kira and McKay. This is old photos, but I like this photo because it makes me look younger. Uh, so McKay is 11 now. He has his very first football game today, very first tackle football game, and my daughter is 15. And I have a private practice in Trophy Club, Texas, which is really close to uh, Dr. Ho's office just around the corner. Uh, and this is my team. And th my team is a big part of what, what we do. And I, I don't think we give enough credit to our teams uh, because they really are a huge part of what we do. Um, this, oh, video's not working. Uh, this is one of the biggest moments in my life. Uh, I got quoted in contemporary orthodontics. And if you don't know what contemporary orthodontics is, it's, it's like the Bible for uh, orthodontists. Uh, it was written by the late Bill Prophet. Um, and this is the fifth edition. And when the fifth edition came out, I was so excited. Uh, and then the sixth edition came out, and I was no longer in it. So it lasted for a couple years. My, my fame lasted for a couple years. So th this is the this is the first time I've ever done this uh, video um, with this many people, so I'm going to be interested to see how it works. But this next video, I want you guys to really focus and count how many passes are made by the, by the players in white. Is that not working? Nope. Oh no, it's not going to work. Why is it not working? I feel like a grade school teacher that can't work the VCR.
count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. All right, who, raise your hand if you got 16 passes. Raise your hand if you got 15 passes. Raise your hand if you got 14 passes. Okay, a lot of you didn't count, it looks like. <laughs> so, so, people saw passes, right? Okay, of those people who were counting the passes, right, the correct number was actually 16, all right? So, if you were counting the passes, did you see the gorilla? So who saw the gorilla? Raise your hand if you saw the gorilla. Raise your hand if you didn't see the gorilla. Usually, typically in an audience this large, 50% of the people will not see the gorilla, right? So of the people who saw the gorilla now, who noticed the, black, uh, uh, the player in black leaving the stage? Two people, three people? How many people noticed the color of the screen changing from red to orange. Did anybody need to see that? All right. So we can go back and watch that boat uh, and see the gorilla, but <laughs> we're not going to do that because it's not working. Yeah, so the, or the original was... So I bring that up because we do a lot of things in dentistry where our attention is so focused on, on some aspect of dentistry. We get so focused that we have what, we call, what is called, and where this, this Daniel Simmons lecture comes from, it's called inattention blindness, all right? And so I'm going to walk you through a typical day. So the next five patients that come to your office are going to be in this next screen. So this is our first patient. This is Lauren. So Lauren's chief complaint is she doesn't like her smile, all right? So this is Lauren's teeth. So you go to the next room. You have your second patient. This is Daniel. So Daniel just recently finished orthodontics. He just got out of braces not too long ago. But he's also unhappy with his smile. So he's unhappy with his smile. We go, we, we're done with Daniel, and we're going to move on to our third patient of the day. And this is Emily. So Emily's chief complaint is also, I'm unhappy with my smile. And then we're going to move to our fourth patient of the morning, and this is Holly. And Holly, while she seems shocked by the photo, is also unhappy with her smile. And this is Holly's photo. And then our fifth, fifth patient of the day is Debbie. Debbie was added to your schedule she comes immediately from her other dentist's office, and she says, I am unhappy with my smile. I just got this partial, and I am extremely unhappy with it. So, did anyone see the gorilla in these, in these patients? And the gorilla in these patients is ortho. All of these patients need ortho, right? And the way we can get a good result in all of these patients is by using ortho. But the question becomes... And the question that, that plagues us, right, and, and that where we don't get that information in dental school is where do you start? Where do you start with these cases, right? You can see that this patient needs ortho. You can see the, what you want to be the final outcome, but where do you start? So the first principle we're going to talk about today is all ortho diagnosis and treatment planning starts with the upper central incisor. It's key. The upper and central incisor is key. It's like back in second year of dental school, building your first denture. You start with the position of the upper central incisor. And as an orthodontist, this is a way that I can communicate with my general dentist colleagues of where we want to position things. All right? But how do we do this? And in orthodontics, we use something that used to be called a visual treatment objective, but now we're changing it to a virtual treatment objective, and we're going to talk about how we do this. But visual treatment objective, so what is a, 
what is a VTO, or a virtual treatment objective, visual treatment objective. This is the roadmap, this is the plan, this is how we get from point A to point B. It is the space analysis, tooth movement, and anchorage needs for every case. So, we have to set some ground rules, right, so of using a, a, an orthodontic treatment plan. The first one, like we said, the upper incisor is key. The second is the mandible is the template for the maxilla. Why is that? Well, the mandible has limits, right? We cannot expand a mandible. So the mandible is the template for the maxilla. <sighs> Proper overjet and overbite are key, right? That's one of our goals in orthodontics. We want good alignment of our teeth. We want minimal canine expansion. And, and this is kind of, it continues to be controversial, but the, the issue is in orthodontics, there's very little we agree on as orthodontists, but there's one thing that the research always bears out, and expanding the inner canine width, the lower inner canine width, is the least stable thing in orthodontics. It always relapses. And so when you see adult patients who say, I had ortho, and their lower incisors are crowded, what happened? Lower incisors were expanded, and they relapsed, right? That's why we use fixed retainers in orthodontics, because sometimes you have to expand the lower inner canine width. If you expand it, it will relapse. As we age, the lower inner canine width always narrows, right? It's like death and taxes. Happens to everybody. <laughs> we want to level the curve of, or excuse me, we want to correct the midline discrepancy and level the curve of speed. And then, we want to maintain the lower arch form, and that goes back to that lower inner canine width. Maintaining your lower original arch form is the most stable uh, way to maintain alignment. And then we want to meet our cephalometric goals in orthodontics. All right, so I'm gonna use, I use three charts when I'm, when I'm diagnosing a patient and when I'm treatment planning. And so these are the three charts. The first chart is the molar, molar classification on the right and the left and the upper and lower midline deviation. And we're, we're gonna walk through these in a, in a few cases here to show you. Chart number two is the lower arch length discrepancy. And we record it as both a right side and a left side, and an anterior and a posterior. And then chart three is a visual representation of the proposed dental movements. So let's go back to that first patient of the day. Let's go back to Lauren. So she's in the chair. She's unhappy with her smile. So she's a cute little girl, but we've got some orthodontic problems, don't we? So what do we do? So the first thing, we're gonna go to that first chart and we're gonna diagnose. So the molar classification is angle class one and it's right where we want it. So that's gonna be a zero relationship. So there's gonna be no change there. But our lower midline is about a half a millimeter to the patient's left, so when the patient when the midline's there and we want to move it back to the right, it's going to create space on the left-hand side and it's going to cause crowding on the right-hand side. As the midline moves back to the center of the arch, we create space on the side we're moving away from and create crowding on the side we're moving to. All right. So then we're going to go to the lower arch discrepancy. So that's the midline relationship. All right, so it transfers. So then we, we divide, I always divide the arch up into little quadrants, right? So we like doing quadrant dentistry. So the crowding in this area is about two millimeters, right? So a millimeter here, a millimeter here. On the other side, we have a little bit more because we're gonna count the, the crowding here, here, and here. And then that's gonna transfer because there is no posterior crowding. All right, and then the curve of speed, when we level a curve of speed in orthodontics, it requires half the depth of the curve of speed in arch length. So if you have a two millimeter curve of speed, to level that curve of speed, it requires one millimeter of space. All right, so half the depth of the curve of speed. And so this patient has a one millimeter curve of speed, so it's gonna require an additional amount of arch length for that. So, we get to this point, and this is kind of all the static information that we need. But then, 
We need dynamic information. And this is where we're going to talk about what we just mentioned, the VTO. So this is where we dive in right here. All right, so here is Lauren. Can everybody see her cephalometric radiograph here? So it's nice with technology now, and there's many different programs that do that, this, but when I treatment plan a case, I want to see where my incisors are going to end up. So in Lauren, what I want to do is I want to bring her lower incisor forward, right? Slightly. Whoa, that's too much. All right. I want to bring her upper incisor forward, give her a little bit more upper lip support. And I'll bring that lower incisor forward just a little bit more. All right, and so now, when, you, when we, cephalometrics kind of sometimes get scary uh, because you haven't seen a lot of these x-rays, right? But it really is just looking at where we want the upper and lower incisor to end up in the patient's face. So when I treatment plan a patient, I want to position those upper and lower incisors relative to the patient's face. And this goes back to that second year in dental school when you're setting a denture, right? So because we brought our incisors forward, can you see that little box right there? You can't. It, it tells us that we created two millimeters of space. So then we go back to our chart. go back to our chart, and we add that in. So now our incisors are coming forward one millimeter on each side. And our initial discrepancy is two millimeters of crowding on each side of the arch. And then orthodontics becomes easy because this becomes a math problem. So the math problem here is how do we solve four millimeters of crowding? And these are our choices. We can strip or do interproximal reduction, we can expand, we can distalize, or we can extract. Those are our options. We have three options in orthodontics. We can strip, we can expand, we can extract, or distalize. Sorry, four options. All right, so what we're going to do in this case is we are going to do some IPR. We're going to do a little bit of expansion, because all braces are expan expansile, and that is going so that's going to bring us to our endpoint. So we're moving our, so our visual representation of our tooth movement, we're moving our midline half a millimeter to the right, cuspids move back slightly, and then there we are, right? So we do our interproximal reduction, and we set, like when I do an Invisalign case, I send this same information to Invisalign. I say, I want two millimeters of, of total IPR in the arch, I want half a millimeter on the right, one and a half on the left, or whatever I need. All right. And that way, it's coming back to me already exactly what I propose based on the, the uh, BTO. All right, so let's, we're feeling pretty confident now, so let's move on to our second patient of the morning. Here's Daniel. So this is Daniel. So Daniel, like I said, he just finished orthodontics a few months ago, but he's not super happy with his smile. Right? So he's had a little bit of relapse. Maybe he didn't wear his retainer, but he's just not happy. So here's the lower arch, minimal crowding. So his buccal occlusion doesn't look bad, right? He's class one. Class one. Facially, I, th I think he had a poor result. I don't like his lip support. His lips are too procumbent. And this is what he looks like in his cephalometric x-ray. Right. So, what do we do? What do we treatment plan? How do we treatment plan this case? Well, we dive back in here. So, this is where his incisors are positioned, 
right? And you can see it in your photos when the light is reflected at the incisal edge of the, of the incisors, that tells you that those teeth are too far proclined. And you can see, right, you wouldn't be happy if you had a denture with teeth like that. So what are we going to do? So he has minimal crowding. What do we want to do here in this case? We want to take the incisors just like a denture and we want to say, where would, where would that better be positioned in his, in his face and in his mouth and in his smile. So we're going to take those, those teeth and we're going to move them back. We're going to upright them. And then the lips will follow the teeth. So we're going to project that our lower lip will come back. The lower lip doesn't lengthen. It will come down and follow the incisor. And the upper lip will come back. And the upper lip will come together with the lower lip. And this is real quick. We're just doing this right here in, the, in this conference room. But this is what I do for every patient. And it takes me, like you, like you saw, just a few minutes there. Now, we'll dial in, in a little bit better when the patient's not there, but this is one of the things we show to our patients, like, hey, I, I think I know why you don't like your smile, and it's because of the position of your, your upper and lower incisor. But then what you see here is every movement in orthodontics is going to cost or give you space. And so this is going to cost the patient to, if we want to get to this position where we're happier with our incisor position, this is going to cost 11 millimeters of space, 12 millimeters of space. So all of a sudden, when we go, to, we go into that chart, right? So here's that. Can you guys see that? Kind of small. But this is the same chart, basically, just in graphic formation. I can't. Uh, it's kind of weird because I'm logging into my office, and I can't actually maximize it. Anyway, I'll, I'll walk through it. So again, we start with the midlines. The midlines in this case are on. So we don't need to change the midlines. We're not going to gain or lose space by moving the midlines. Right? We do have a little bit of crowding in this case. Right? But like we said, it's minimal. I can maximize this, maybe. Nope. It, it, yeah, it's very minimal. Minimal lower incisor crowding. So we maybe have a millimeter on that lower left-hand side, zero on the lower right, zero in the premolars, zero in the molars. But we're moving our incisors 11 millimeters, and it's costing us 11 millimeters of space. So we divide that 11 millimeters on both sides, and we come out with, right, whatever, five and a half, whatever. And so that, that incisor position now is five and a half millimeters moving posterior on both sides. And so all of a sudden, this minimally crowded case actually has about six, seven millimeters of crowding on each side. And so what do we have? What are our options? We can do IPR, seven millimeters of crowding, seven millimeters of IPR on each right and left is a little too much. We could distalize, but distalizing lower molars is very difficult. It's very hard. We could expand, but we're not going to expand seven millimeters, not with, not with keeping the teeth in the bone. Or we could extract. So in this case, what we did is extract. So here's Daniel. Maintained the posterior occlusion, and you can see the change in his profile, and he was, he was very pleased, extremely happy patient. Uh, all of his sisters then, then came to us, which, was, which is always good. When you have family members that refer other family members, that's like one of the, the best things. All right, so we're, we're feeling pretty confident so far today. How much time do I have? 
Oh, I have 30 minutes? Oh, yeah, we're going to finish early. 20 minutes, okay. All right, so we're, we're feeling pretty good. Today is going smooth. So we're going to go to our next patient, and this is Emily. So Emily is unhappy with her smile. All of our patients are unhappy with their smile. So here's Emily. She's got quite a bit of lower incisor crowding. Uh, she's got a class 2 subdivision malocclusion. One of her sides class 2, one of her sides class 1. Right, so here you can see she needs a crown. I know you guys can see that. But here she is. She's unhappy with her smile. So what do we do? What do we do when we treatment plan this patient? So just like every other patient, we're going to dive in and we're going to do a VTO because that's what we do. So here's Emily. So what do we do? We're going to position our upper and lower incisor. So our upper incisor, if you ignore everything happening below the upper incisor, uh, the upper incisor is not in, a pretty, not in a terrible position relative to her face. So if you block off everything that's happening below the, low, the upper incisor, that's not too bad. So I actually like and approve of her position of her upper incisor. So then what do we have to do? We have to create positive overbite and overjet in this case. So what do we do? Can we take a lower incisor and bring it out to the, to the upper incisor like that? Not without bringing that tooth completely out of bone. Right? So that's not a, that's not a good option. Right? Can we take the upper incisor and move it back? We can, that's an acceptable movement in orthodontics, but it, it moves her upper incisor out of the position that we said earlier was a good aesthetic position. So when you have a case like this, where you have the position of the upper and so, lower incisor so far discrepant, the only way to treat this is with jaw surgery, right? And so we show the patient what, what's going to happen in jaw surgery. We're going to move the lower jaw forward. We're going to rotate the upper and lower jaw and move the upper jaw up and bring the lower jaw forward in a counterclockwise ro rotation. Like you see here. That improves the occlusal plane. And then the lower lip will roll back into a more aesthetic position. The upper lip come down. All right. So this becomes our our visual treatment objective for Emily. And I, and in the consultation I sit with Emily and I say, "Look, this is the best option. I know nobody wants to hear surgery." But to get a good, acceptable result in your case, we are going to have to do jaw surgery. And the interesting thing is, with most of these patients, they already know. They've been to plastic surgeons. They wanted to get submental fat removed. The plastic surgeon said, maybe that won't work. And most of the time, it's because they have a short lower jaw length. And so most of these patients, they know. They know what they're, they're going to do. And so then, I'm not going to walk through it this time. But we do a VTO, we address her lower incisor crowding, and we're going to address it again with a tooth extraction. And we, on her, because of where her crowding was, we extracted a lower incisor. So what happens in a surgery case is we move the dentition to the ideal position. So the lower incisor is going to come back. The lower incisor is going to come back relative to the upper incisor because we're, we're centering it 
over the mandibular bone. And so what happens in these pre-surgical movements is the occlusion gets worse. And so this becomes very frightening for the patient, but you, you kind of coach them along the way and you talk to them about um, what is going to happen. So here's Emily as we prepare for surgery, right? So you can see the mandibular deformity has gotten worse. It looks worse on it facially because the lower incisors are no longer flared. We're setting her up for surgery. And then here is her post-surgical outcome. So here's Emily. And now she's ready for our restorative dentist to do that crown on number eight there. And who wouldn't rather work on a typodont, right? Who wouldn't rather work on a typodont? That, and, and that's the thing that ortho can bring to your practice, whether you're doing it yourself or you're referring it out. You're setting your restorative dentistry up in a much better position. And here's the movements of the upper and lower jaw. And here's her, her profile change. So, man, we killed it on those first three. Those first three patients, we're walking into room four thinking, man, we are, we are the king of the world here. So this is Holly. So Holly comes in, and she doesn't like her smile as well. Right, you can see extensive amounts of wear, multiple missing teeth, really a mutilated dentition. So what do we do? We go to our VTO. But for Holly, our incisor position relative to her face, while that upper incisor is short, our incisor position is actually pretty good relative to her face. That upper incisor could come forward a little bit, but that's not going to change the world. So we go on to our next principle. So our first principle was we always start with the position of the upper incisor, and we do a VTO. The second principle that we're going to talk about is in adult patients, especially adult patients with wear, is we're going to treat adult patients to the gingival margins in a healthy patient or to bone levels in a periodontally compromised patient, right? And how do we do this? You can use, you can use the fancy software, the, what was it, the D, DTO or something, yeah. DTS. Or you can be like Dr. Jolly and do something cheaper, which is called Photoshop. <laughs> so, and this, this again takes five minutes, right? So this, this is actually from uh, Spear Study Club online. If you guys do Spear Study Club, you can download these templates. If not, it's really actually very easy to create these shapes in, in Keynote or Photoshop. And again, this takes no time at all. You can have your assistants do it. And we show this to the patient. We say, look, the yellow shows us where your teeth are. And the white shows us where we would like your teeth to be. And then the patient can kind of visualize, right, using that virtual treatment objective that we talked about. This is our virtual treatment objective for this type of patient. They can visualize what the outcome is going to be. Then, what do we do? And this, this is actually kind of very exciting because when I was in orthodontic residency, we would take these models and we would, we would take a set of models and we would cut them out analog with a jeweler saw and we would wax them up in, um, in wax. But now we have the opportunity to use virtual treatment setups, right? And there are lots of them and they're quick and they're super easy. Invisalign has, an, has one. If you have the iTero, you've probably used it. It's the Invisalign Outcome Simulator. It works really well. Archform is what I use in my office to create my own in-house aligners. ULab is another in-house aligner. Archid, Archid Lab, Ortho Analyzer, Nemocast, there's, there's tons of these, right? So in this patient, really quickly, I said, Holly, let's just go out. Let's, let me get a scan so we can kind of show you where we want to work from. 
We are going to send this information along to your dentist so they kind of have a plan. And so we just, we really quickly, we got a 3D scan uh, using our iTero, and we did a setup. And we said, look, our, the canines in that, in that um, PowerPoint, right, in our little VTO here, the canines don't really move. So the canines are going to become our key tooth. And we're going to kind of set everything up relative to the canines. So when we're looking at the gingival levels, because this patient has a healthy periodontium, so we want the central incisors and the canines to be about at the same level. We want the lateral incisors to be a little bit lower. Um, and then we're going to look at the occlusion, and we're going to say those missing teeth, we're going to open up for premolar implants, right? Even though this side is a molar, we understand we're missing a molar, but the occlusion just works better if we're opening the space up for a premolar size implant relative to a molar. And once she says, okay, I can, Holly says, I can see that. I understand where we're going now with this. So then, as the orthodontics becomes very easy because we're working toward this objective. And so braces go on, we start moving the teeth, and once we get to that kind of pre-established relationship where we're looking and it matches our VTO, right? So there's the VTO, there's our outcome. Then we say, okay, Holly, I know you're tired of looking like a pirate. So let's get some temporaries on. And what, what I like to do and, and what we've started doing is doing a second VTO. So I know we talked about digital uh, workflow. This is kind of our digital workflow in my office. So we will do a second scan at this point, second iTero scan. And what we do is we use a free program called Mesh Mixer. Who's familiar with Mesh Mixer? So Mesh Mixer, you should get familiar with it. If you want a 3D print in your office, it is super fun and super easy. So Mesh Mixer. Then you can download, take a picture of this. There are free tooth libraries, and these are two of them. So if you go on Google and you search for these names, you can download free tooth libraries. And then let's see if this, everybody cross your fingers that this video works. Is that working? No. I worked so hard to put those videos in. <laughs> All right, so I want to show you how easy this is. So this is just this is just me on Mesh Mixer, and literally all you do is you will go in, you'll select the tooth that you want, and you drop it into place. And then you just drag it to where you want it to be. And my, my assistants love to do this because it's, I mean, it's fun. It is fun. Like, where, did, where was this when we were all waxing up teeth, <laughs> right? Right, and then once you're happy with it, then you can just take that directly from Mesh Mixer. And what we do is we print it out using our Sprint Ray 3D printer. There's more affordable options now than Sprint Ray. Sprint Ray we bought like two or three years ago. Uh, but you know, any any cubic has a good printer that's under a thousand dollars. I think it's like five hundred dollars. Uh, and you can print these out, and we, we print them out, um, and we'll send them along to the dentist saying, hey, this is what we think the teeth should look like, and then they can use it if they want. If they don't, that's fine. 
so we, oh, we're not playing. I thought we were playing. So this is our, our Sprint Ray printer. And it, it's nice. We do, in, we, like I said, we do our own in-house aligners. We do Invisalign and in-house aligners for more minor stuff. And so then the patient comes back to us looking like this. And again, this becomes a very easy orthodontic case for us now at this point. We like our positions of our incisors. Now it's just a matter of finishing the case. So man, we, we killed it with Holly, didn't we? So let's move on to our fifth patient of the morning. And this is, this is one of my, my favorite patients. This is Debbie. So there's, there's some information I didn't tell you about Debbie. So Debbie, she comes into my office and she said, she was flaming mad. She said, I just got this partial dentistry from my dentist. I'm never going back to him. I hate it. Uh, and I'm like, well, I don't know like what I can do for you. Like this is not. And then she takes the partial denture out. And there's some history here. So the history is when Debbie was young, she had, and this is again, just like Dr. House says, all patients lie, right? But so this is the story she told us. She said she, when she was younger, her upper right central incisor erupted very, she didn't say ectopically, but it, she described it ectopically. The upper central incisor was erupted really far out. And so what the dentist did is they took the central incisor out and they did a three unit bridge. And then she said, I looked great, I was happy, I went along with my life. Uh, but then the three unit bridge failed. And so the, the left central incisor failed. And so then they did this six unit bridge. And she went along for a while and eventually that failed and that's when she got the partial. The problem is all of the, the restorative work was doomed to failure because of her occlusion. So you look, the, the mandible is completely inside the maxilla. So without doing ortho on this patient, any restorative dentistry is going to fail. So here we are. Here she is, very, very mutilated dentition. Here's the lower arch, missing molars. So here's the cast. So this, I actually treated this uh, a few years ago. Um, and so you will see what we did before digital. So here we are. And so with this patient, what we do is we assemble a team. We get our restorative dentist. We meet with the restorative dentist. We meet with the surgeon. We meet with the periodontist, whoever's going to be involved. And what we do is we do a VTO. Uh, uh, yeah, I have time. Okay. So let's dive in and do a VTO on this patient, because this one's actually kind of interesting, because I think this kind of illustrates uh, a lot of the points that we were talking about. So with, with Debbie here, we always want to start with the position of the upper incisor. So, but you say to yourself, well, we don't have an upper incisor, Dr. Jolly. That's true, we don't. But we can imagine where we want the upper incisor to be. So what we do is we're gonna dive into our software and we're gonna position that upper incisor exactly where we want it. Oh, that's retreated, sorry. Yes. So I'm using Dolphin, but, but all cephalometric softwares uh, do this. They all do the same thing. And there's, some, there's actually free ones uh, that you can download. I think there's actually even an app uh, for cephalometric tracing. But, uh, but I'm using Dolphin. It's, it's, also my, it's also my scheduling and practice management. And so the imaging portion is just like a small portion of it. Just like EagleSoft has like imaging. This is like for orthodontists. 
Uh, and that's why we use it. It's, it's not better than any other one. And, and there's free ones that are available. Um, so again, here's our upper incisor. We want to position it where we want the upper incisor relative to her face. So actually, we want that upper incisor a little bit lower. And I want it actually a little bit more upright. But then we look to ourselves, how can we get proper overjet and overbite in this patient? Well, the real issue, right, not only the transverse problem that she has in the mandible, but she has an AP problem that's undiscovered where the, the lower jaw actually needs to come forward, just like our earlier patient. So this patient not only needs restorative, orthodontics, but she also needs surgery as well. And so this is going to be our outcome. This is what our VTO is, and this is what everybody on the team is going to be working for. And you can sit here and play around with it, and that's what I do, and it's fun. All right. So we take that information, and then we're going to... Nope. Sorry, I'm doing the presentation without you guys now. So then we're going to do an orthodontic setup, right? So just like we saw in Holly, what we're going to do is we're going to position the teeth and, and look at where our outcome is going to be. So with her, again, this is before I was doing digital. So we mounted this on an articulator. We cut out the teeth, and we positioned them where we wanted. Then we worked with the surgeon and the restorative dentist to come up with um, a tooth solution for her as she's going through orthodontics. So what you'll see in this photo is this is the mounting, and you can see the distance where the saw cut from here to here. That's going to be the distance that the, surger, that the surgeon repositions the lower jaw. So that's our mandibular advancement piece. Now, what we did here is we made basically a bonded bridge for this patient, and we embedded a wire, because this needs to survive the orthodontics as we go through the, the orthodontics, and you'll see it. And so on the lower, we're removing a molar and preparing two implant sites. So this is our patient. So this is as we're preparing for the implants, right? So she's undergoing graft while we're doing the orthodontics. While we're setting up the orthodontics, we're uprighting the lower teeth, to help with the transverse problem, but a lot of the transverse problem is because of there's, the, there's an AP problem. There's a class two, there's a, the mandible's deficient. So this, this appliance right here, all it's doing, it's not expanding the mandible, it's just uprighting those premolars. If you remember from the earlier picture how tipped in they were. So then the implants go in, we're still doing our orthodontics. And this is where, this is where we were talking about how labs will mess it up. So the first set of uh, implant uh, provisionals we got back, they basically took away all the overjet. So they put the implants in, and all of a sudden, now the patient doesn't have an overjet, because the lab's thinking to themselves, hey, I want to I make the, the overjet and overbite right, but this is where the communication has to come in, because we, don't, we actually want this patient to have overjet right now, because we're going to advance the mandible later on. And so we didn't bond brackets to the implants here, because we, we didn't need them. And then we're going to finish the case. She gets a mandibular advancement. And you can see how the bite has changed. And now she has a fixed solution for her problem. And my favorite thing about this, so here's, the, here's our final cephalometric x-ray. But when we take our visual treatment objective, our VTO, and we compare it to our final outcome, you can see how close we were. And that's, that's one of my favorite things to do when I finish a case, is how close was I? Because the better you are, the more predictive you can be, and the, the better your result's going to be. So I want to finish. I know we didn't watch that video very well, and I apologize for that. But I want to, what is, what is the gorilla in your office? How many cases in your office right now do you have that you just don't quite know what to do with? And so a lot of times, you're missing the gorilla. And so... 
Ortho can help you out of a, in a lot of these cases. So always remember ortho. You're going to start with that central incisor position. Do a VTO. Do a setup, and then watch for gorillas. And uh, here's my email address uh, and my phone number. And you can email me or, or uh, that's my office phone number. You can call that, and I'll return your phone call.